Well, I am here once again and very happy uh, to be talking with Massimo Piliucci on Blogging Edge TV. Massimo, uh, let's do our normal uh, meet and greet routine and then we can get started. Sounds good. I'm Massimo Piliucci. I'm the KD Irani Professor of Philosophy at City College uh, in New York. And I'm Daniel Kaufman. I am a Professor of Philosophy and Program Director in the Philosophy Department at Missouri State University. Uh, Massimo, you and I have spoken now twice about the intersection of philosophy and science. Uh, we also did speak a little bit uh, about the, the relevance of philosophy to the more general public. Uh, and today we're going to talk about some things that are maybe more in that uh, latter vein rather than the former. Right. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if science comes up again at some point. Um, I was very interested in an article that recently appeared that you wrote that recently recently appeared on Santia Salon, your your web magazine, um, in which you talked about your recent uh, interest in and foray forays into uh, Stoicism, uh, right? The, the ancient Greek and Roman philosophy of Stoicism, and um, I, I I wanted to uh, talk to you about that today. Uh, maybe you could start up with talking about. Um, why you've, you've had this sudden interest, or not maybe not sudden interest in Stoicism, and what have you found? Right. Is it possible for an interest to be both sudden and not so sudden? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll, ex I'll explain. So, yeah, the recent interest is, in fact, somewhat sudden, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll get in a minute or two how I got there. Um, but I, of course, had, as, have, as you know, a, a long-standing interest in virtue ethics, and, of course, Stoicism is one type of, of ancient virtue ethics, uh, but, um, you know, the, the beginning of it, it really goes back when I was a kid and to the very pedestrian reason that, of course, I grew up in Italy and I studied Roman history. Uh, and I read Seneca in Latin, <laughs> as it turns out, uh, which is fascinating reading. Seneca was, a, you know, huge, uh, you know, from a stylistic perspective, uh, not just content-wise. It was just a, a, a pleasure to read. And um, so I actually was aware and, you know, somewhat interested in Stoicism uh, since literally was a kid, uh, studying in junior high school and high school. Um, but that, you know, for, for sort of entirely uh, serendipitous uh, cultural reasons. Then, of course, um, eventually I developed and, and went back to, to my general interest in philosophy. And I realized that even though my field is philosophy of science, uh, um, I do have a, a strong interest in ancient philosophy, in Greek and Roman uh, philosophy in particular. So from there, the, 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 uh, that led me to uh, virtue ethics. I mean, my interest in ancient philosophy coupled with my interest in sort of ethics and you know, uh, living the good life in the, in the ancient sense of the term, uh, the eudaimonic life, uh, led me to virtue ethics. And then finally from virtue ethics to stories. Now, what actually triggered it was the fact that I became aware of this uh, international event that happens every last week of November, which is called Stoicism Week. Um, and uh, Stoicism Week, which is in fact about to come up, um, is organized by the University of Exeter in, in England. They have essentially what I would refer to as a Stoicism lab. Uh, they allow people to sign up on their website for an ongoing social experiment, uh, social science experiment about Stoicism. Uh, you can download a booklet uh, which tells you the basics of Stoicism as a philosophy, as well as has lots of practical suggestions on how to essentially live one week as a Stoic. Uh, and then they ask people to fill out a questionnaire before, you know, when they start, uh, before they start the, the, the Stoic week and then afterwards, and they uh, publish and update um, uh, data analysis on the effect that practicing Stoicism has on other people. So is it a, it's, a, it's a social science project trying to uh, see the efficacy of Stoic, so, Stoicist Ideas on what? Uh, people's mental health? People's uh, happiness? Uh, yeah, both, to some extent. I mean, it is actually a philosophy project, because this, this, uh, the people that, that run this thing are, are philosophers. But they are interested in uh, what they refer to as evidence-based philosophy, <laughs> mm -hmm. and which is kind of an interesting, of course, um, to be distinguished, by the way, from experimental philosophy, which is a whole different thing. Yes. Um, so uh, this, the idea basically is this. Look, Stoicism is, is, was born as a very practical philosophy, which, of course, today it sounds al almost like an oxymoron, unfortunately, because philosophy has become essentially entirely, almost entirely, a uh, academic discipline, very, na very narrowly specialized, just like any other academic discipline, honestly. It's not just 
philosophy. It's, 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 yeah. you know, if you're talking about literary criticism or science itself, they're, they all become very specialized. But of course, for the ancients, philosophy was a very practical ex, um, um, pursuit. It was about how to, you know, finding out how to live a, a good and moral, a moral life as a, as a chief objective. Uh, but Stoicism in particular was definitely one of the most practically oriented philosophies uh, uh, that developed in uh, Hellenistic uh, Greece and then the, during the Roman Empire. Um, its main competitors were, you know, things like Epicureanism and Cynicism. Of course, Cynicism at the time didn't mean <laughs> what it means today. Right. Uh, it, it was a, a sort of a minimalist um, um, style, style of life and of philosophizing, uh, but nothing to do with what we mean today by, by a cynic being a cynic. So, uh, so Stoicism started out that way. It's a very practical uh, set of, 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 of an exploration and, uh, of, of a very practical way of, of doing of living your life now uh, so it makes sense that today philosophers who are interested or practice stoicism uh, also want to know if in fact uh, it has effects on um, the way people look at the world the, the way people react uh, to events in the world and, and so forth uh, in other words to ask whether the practice actually works uh, it is also to be noted, as you know, that uh, Stoicism is very deeply uh, related uh, and it was inspirational to uh, two of the most um, uh, successful type of psychotherapy that we have today. One is uh, logotherapy and the other one is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, both of them were clearly inspired by uh, Stoic practice. And, of course, the, the therapies uh, aspect went into um, sort of very, very much only an applied sort of psychological uh, look at things, Stoicism has maintained also a philosophical, foundational philosophical approach. It's not just about the practice. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and it's easy to forget that these ancient Greek uh, philosophers, um, they themselves didn't make these sorts of distinctions between sort of academic pursuits and then the pursuits of, right. I mean, Aristotle's famous uh, his theory of catharsis uh, with respect to tragedy is in a sense uh, a kind of... Uh, Psycho psychological approach to the arts, employing the arts. Today we would call this art therapy. Yeah. Um, um, but um, um, you also, uh, before we start getting into some of the details on Stoicism and also on the difference between the classical version and the sorts of the, 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 the modern, your modern interest in it, um, there was another motivation that you indicated in the Scientia Salon piece, which I actually found personally the most interesting, uh, and that was, I'll say it briefly, but then you're going to have to explain it because it begs right. explanation. You said, I need to start preparing for my own death. <laughs> yeah. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that dimension of the motivation and explain a little bit what you mean by that. Right. And as far as I know, that moment, by the way, is a long way away, or at least I hope it is. Yeah. Me I meaning I don't have any urgency that I, that I'm aware of. Of course, as the, as the Stoics would say immediately, uh, fate permitting. <laughs> that is, you know, right. that, that was sort of the, the stoic clause, to, the clause uh, uh, reserve clause to anything. It was like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm doing this, but, you know, fate permitting because things might turn out differently uh, because the universe has different plans. Um, now, yes, so preparing for, what, for your death. I, I've actually been interesting uh, in thoughts about my own demise and, uh, in, since I was really young and since I was a kid. And nothing morbid about it. I mean, it's not like I'm scared of it, no more than, than anybody, I think, is. Um, and certainly, certainly not obsessed uh, by it. But it's just like, okay, from time to time, you know, the, my, my thinking goes in that direction. Say, oh, I wonder, you know, how I will uh, uh, sort of approach that moment. Will I be aware of it? How, will I handle it uh, well? You know, and that sort of stuff. So for somebody who has always had that kind of interest uh, among other things in, in death... Uh, it's sort of sound natural to approach again stoicism, which is supposed to be one of those those uh, philosophical approaches that prepare you to to that point. Um, but also, what happened, of course, is that recently I turned fifty, and um, several things have happened in my life uh, in you know this this year in particular, uh, and including you know this wonderful new job that I got at City College, and you know I, I moved uh, to a, a really nice place in New York, and so on and so forth. You know, relationship-wise, things are going well. But all of that, it's still, you know, the five zero as arbitrary, of course, as data as it, it is. So it makes you ponder and say, okay, so, so I'm at this point in my life, I feel good about what I've done. I, I have reasonable prospects to keep going uh, and enjoy what I have for, for a long time. But, but then what? 
and, you know, so it, it makes you, in, uh, it puts you in, uh, uh, in, a, in a mood of thinking a little more long term, and particularly, of course, thinking about uh, sort of the the end, the end game. Uh, so when I was in the meantime, uh, uh, sort of discovering or, or rediscovering stoicism, one of the things that immediately came to mind was, ah, this this not only can be helpful uh, as a practice right now, but it can also be helpful. Uh, to better prepare to something that I've always wanted to be better prepared for. So you were already investigating this before. So I, I had this image of you having this sort of very um, highbrow midlife crisis. <laughs> and rather than buying a sports car and getting a 19-year-old girlfriend that you uh, decided to sort of start researching uh, stoicism, but that's not how it was, I gather. No, in fact, I, it's, it looks like uh, it looks like if, if you want to talk about midlife crisis, and recently I've had, I'm having about one a, a decade. Uh, you know, when I when I turned forty, <laughs> when I turned forty is actually the time that um, I decided to move from uh, being a professional scientist to becoming you know, a philosopher. I went back to my uh, to graduate school and got my PhD in philosophy, and and, and that's why I, I got here now. So now, ten years later, it's like, oh, it's time to take another look at uh, at how things are going. Right. I wouldn't really call them crisis. I would call them, you know, a, a good excuse again, as I understand it, you know, and I completely acknowledge it that uh, these these dates are entirely arbitrary. But it's a good excuse for pausing and reflecting on sort of the big picture, which I think is something that we should all do at some point or other, and uh, repeatedly in life. You know, again, you don't want to be obsessed by it. You don't want to do it every minute, otherwise you don't live your life. Um, but once in a while, I think it's a good idea. Okay, so maybe the way into this is to first of all talk a little bit about your understanding of how the ancient Greeks viewed philosophy as a kind of guide to life in contrast with the modern, uh, very uh, professionalized and academic notion, um, then specifically what you found in Stoicism, and then also what is involved in modernizing, yeah. uh, making this useful to you in a modern context. Maybe you could talk a little bit about those things. Oh, those, those, those are excellent, all excellent questions. So let's, so let's start with the, the ancient view of philosophy versus the modern one. Um, so, as you mentioned a minute ago, philosophy and psychology uh, were one one thing until actually fairly late, until the you know late nineteenth century. You know, William James, right. uh, if you want to pick a name, uh, started sort of spinning out um, uh, uh, psychology as an independent discipline. Uh, so Aristotle and Epicurus and and, and uh, Zeno the Stoic, not to be confused, of course, with the, the Zeno from the of the Paradoxes, who was a pre-Socratic philosopher, and so on and so forth, and Plato. Um, they all saw philosophy not only as a pursuit of sort of knowledge broadly construed, but also in particular as a pursuit of the question of what 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 does it mean to live a good life? And by good life, they didn't mean a life of uh, you know pleasure and debauchery, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, despite the bad reputation that, that the word Epicurean uh, has today, which was actually the result of, of, of uh, a smearing campaign by the Christians for, for, right, for whom right. uh, Epicurean, Epicureanism was a major uh, uh, sort of rival, essentially, in the early Roman Empire. Um, now, so, so the ancient conception was this idea that philosophy is both about sort of the this broadest possible understanding of the world and also, more importantly, arguably for most philosophers, our place in the world and how we, we, we are to conduct our life, in, hence the, the very practical aspect of it. But the, those aspects were, were actually connected. That is, it's not like the ancients saw these, these um, you know, we do natural science over here, we do psychology over there, we do philosophy over, over here, metaphysics over here. It was all one bundle. In fact, let's talking just about the Stoics in particular, the Stoics famously had a, a tripartite uh, notion of their philosophy. They had three different aspects to their philosophy. One that they referred to as logic, one that they referred to as ethics, and the other one that they referred to as physics. Um, and But they saw the three of them as very deeply interconnected, not as three different things that they were doing. Uh, what they meant by logic was not just what we mean today. It was also that, because the Stoics, by the way, uh, they contribute significantly and originally to the development of logic, right. as we understand it today. Uh, but uh, but they were also interested more in general uh, in, in having uh, developing a theory of knowledge. They were uh, interested in, in uh, rhetoric. They were rest, interested in, in, in argument and discourse. So more very general in you know how to think rationally, essentially about about things. Um, the physics, what they call physics, actually included what we today would call uh, natural philosophy, so all, all of science, essentially, not just yeah. physics per se, but also metaphysics. 
Right. Uh, you know, so sort of the deep understanding of or, or, or way of thinking about uh, the, the, the nature of reality. And of course, you can see once you define them that way, you can see how they thought that both both of these two will actually be crucial uh, for a good understanding of ethics. For the Stoics, you couldn't really practice uh, a good ethical life unless you, unless you understood something about the way the world is. So you had to get your physics and metaphysics straight. And also, unless you could, uh, you, you had a good understanding or knowledge of human reasoning. So you had to get your epistemology and your logic uh, right as well. So these, these things were all uh, together. Now today, of course, if you talk to a philosopher who specializes in logic and you say, so what do you think that uh, implies for your ethics? He's going to stare at you with a blank stare and it's like, what the hell are you talking about, right? Which I think it's unfortunate. I mean, it, to some extent, it is inevitable. You know, it's, it's, it's too easy to bash uh, sort of academic philosophy for being disconnected from the world. As I said in, uh, a few minutes ago, every academic discipline is to some extent uh, disconnected by, you know, by, by its own nature. Uh, we live in, in an environment as academics where if you want to uh, pursue an academic career, you have to publish something original. And, you know, especially in philosophy, since people have been publishing original things for 2,500 years, uh, it gets increasingly difficult to, to find something new. So you get increasingly more specialized. So I, I'm not blaming necessarily academics academia uh, per se. What I am, however, concerned with is the fact that modern academics and modern academic philosophers uh, don't see a value, many of them, there are exceptions, I think I'm one of them, uh, but they don't see a value at all uh, in sort of practical philosophy, in bringing philosophy back out to the public and, and uh, as an alternative to religion, uh, for instance, as a way to think about how to live your life. In fact, not only they don't care about it, but they often they are positively hostile to it. They think it's a, it's a waste of time or it's a sort of cheapening of the discipline and that sort of stuff. And on that one, I couldn't possibly disagree more. I think I think they're profoundly mistaken on that. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I mean, it's fine for us to blame philosophers because we're philosophers. We have to police our own. We'll let the others police their own disciplines. Yeah. Um, but but I do think that the philosophers in this regard have made they made one fundamental choice that sort of forced them down this road, and that is they chose to disciplinize in the same manner as the sciences. Yeah. With, with the idea being that, for, that simply because in the sciences, breaking up the questions into smaller and smaller pieces yields fruit, right. that the same would be true in philosophy. But I think that that's actually wrong. I think that in philosophy, while there is some fruit to be borne by breaking the questions into smaller pieces, there's more fruit to be uh, borne from connecting the pieces together. Yeah. And um, uh, I don't think it's a surprise that the people who work in logic have nothing to do with the people who work in ethics because we're treating this like you would treat different subjects in the sciences right. uh, as having no relationship to each other. Right. And, and if you think about now, I think, I think you're right on that, although, again, to, to be fair to the, to the philosophers, which in this case means to be fair to ourselves, uh, uh, it's not like just philosophy outside of the sciences has done that. I mean, if you look at, you know, uh, literary criticism, or if you look yeah. at, you know, any, pretty much, as, as I said, or any, any other uh, academic discipline, they're all done the same. And, and you're right, I think they all model themselves under the sci after the sciences, which may make more or less sense depending on the discipline and, and, and the extent to which, uh, to which it is done, yes. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit uh, more um, t to the relationship between the knowledge seeking side of and we're talking we're staying within the ancient conception right now yeah between the um knowledge seeking side and the praxis side um because it's not a simple relation of the knowledge side sort of provides you with the instructions that you then follow that allow you to sort of successfully navigate the praxis side aristotle in the ethics he, he very clearly indicates that there are very different kinds of education involved in developing right. good habits say on the one hand versus acquiring knowledge of, let's say, rules, on another hand. Um, could you talk a little bit more to how you understand how the ancients connected the knowledge sphere to the praxis sphere? Yeah, for, well, first of all, they, they were doing it in different ways. Like, for instance, let's not forget that some ancient philosophers, like the atomists, were very much interested in natural philosophy, and as far as we know, actually 
mostly in natural philosophy as opposed to, say, ethics. Right. Um, you know, I mean, obviously I say as far as we know because we have only fragments of, of what the atomists wrote. Uh, but then you move to, to, for instance, Socrates, at least the way in which we understand him through Plato. And Socrates had pretty much no interest in natural philosophy. I mean, he, he was right. famous for not leave, never leaving the city of Athens. You know, he thought that there was nothing in nature that could possibly be teaching him anything about uh, about ethics. Now, that seems like may maybe that was a caricature, maybe that was just Plato. But nonetheless, um, it, it's clear that both in uh, Socrates and Plato in particular, of which we do have an extensive collection of writings, uh, there's very little in that in that in that department. So he was mostly interested, really, in in, in what we would to get to today call ethics, and sort of broadly construed. Uh, Aristotle went back to have interest in both. I mean, obviously, you know, we we remember him for the Nicomachean ethics just as much as we remember from the phys for the physics. Yeah. Um, and uh, and he was, you know, uh, the first uh, arguably empirical biologist. I mean, he, he went out and do he literally did field work in in on the island of Lesbo. Uh, looking at the shape of shells and things like that. So Aristotle was definitely very much the, 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 um, uh, the, the kind of person where all of these things were of interest, but they didn't necessarily inform them I I each other in the way that I described a few minutes ago. I think that the description I, that I gave earlier of a pursuit of logic and physics in um, focus, not entirely, but but, but to a great extent into the, the uh, feeding into ethics, that's really a stoic uh, perspective okay. more than anything else. So the ancients had, in other words, different ways of looking at how the different um, uh, types of knowledge would interact with each other. And it was perfectly acceptable and understandable for them uh, to pursue one, one aspect without necessarily much of a you know, deep interconnection with the others other than in general, the, as philosophers, they were interested in in in, uh, in a broad construction of the of the uh, what we today consider the term knowledge. So it, the answer, and I was to that to, to your question, is that it depends. <laughs> it depends. And um, you know, I started out interestingly. My interest, my my, my initial interest in, in virtue ethics uh, was definitely Aristotelian in nature. Um, and and for that's for a variety of reasons. I think that Aristotle wrote some of the most interesting things about. Uh, ethics, um, but also I was interested, I was sort of attracted by uh, the general picture of Aristotle as a sort of an all-purpose learner, uh, what, what something that much, much later on became as, you know, known as a Renaissance man, of course. Yeah. Um, but um, once I got into Stoicism, then I started saying, okay, so here's a different way of looking at, thing, uh, at things, and Stoicism is really supposed to be providing, it's an attempt to provide a coherent philosophy of life. And now that's where I think one should be careful, uh, and maybe that's where that's going to offer us a, a good um, jumping point to get into the sort of modern uh, stoicism or what I refer to as neo stoicism. Yes, um, and that's so. So because the the, the warning there is, of course, the, the cautionary uh, warning there is that you know be careful any time you hear about a all comprehensive philosophy of anything because. Comprehensive philosophical systems have a nasty tendency to sort of to, uh, make up stuff as they go and 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 uh, not really you know and become something of a, of a, of their own autonomous thing which is may or may not be connected with the way in which reality is. I mean, think about Marxism for instance. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you are a Marxist, then you start seeing everything in terms of a certain very limited number of, of sort of criteria, mostly of course economic struggles among among classes. And yeah. while I do think that there is an interest and in, in a, in a value to that perspective, I wouldn't adopt that as a philosophy of life. Let's say you know, it's, it's just a little too constraining and a little too detached from the way I think the world actually is. So with that in mind, meaning that any comprehensive philosophy needs to be taken with a grain of salt, uh, in fact, a somewhat large grain of salt. Yeah, yeah. Nonetheless, what I mean by a comprehensive philosophy is this. I, I, I've been looking for a, for a while, I've been sort of constructing on my own and from bits and pieces of different, uh, from different uh, places, uh, what I would refer to as a coherent philosophy, meaning I want to develop in my life a view of the world and of myself that is coherent. Um, and by coherent, I mean both coherent internally, uh, that you know, there are as few contradictions as possible between what I think on, of one uh, aspect of, of the world and what I think about another aspect of the world. And that's because as a philosopher, incoherence makes me nervous. Um, but also, 
coherent with the way the world actually is. I'm not talking just about self-contained coherence. That, I think, is the problem with a lot of uh, comprehensive philosophical systems. Uh, like, you know, you can, you can take, for instance, Christianity or any religion as a self-contained, coherent, more or less, philosophical system, except that I think it's incoherent with the way the world is. You know, I don't think that there are uh, gods out there, and therefore right. I don't think that one can uh, reasonably take that sort of approach and say, oh, yeah, but I have a coherent philosophy. Depends on what you mean. Coherent internally, yes, but I'm interested in both internal coherence and as much coherence as possible with the external world. Which brings us now to neo-Stoicism. Because, of course, the original Stoicism is not coherent uh, with the external world as we understand it today. Not surprisingly. Uh, particularly in the area of physics and metaphysics. I Can mean, you explain a little bit why? I mean, what is it primarily about the Stoic metaphysics? And you'll probably have to say a little bit about it since right. I'm sure <laughs> much of the audience doesn't know doesn't know it. It's relatively esoteric. Um, right. But what what is it about the ancient Stoic metaphysics? Let's draw, leave the physics out only because the physics seems to me that, that the physics is ultimately a slave to the metaphysics, especially mm-hmm. in the ancient Greek uh, systems. Right. Um, what, what is it about the Stoic metaphysics that's renders it not amenable to a modern... Is it because it's teleological? Yeah, so I wouldn't go as far as saying not amenable, but I'd say that it needs to be interpreted or reinterpreted, uh, hence the, the, my preferred term of neo-Stoicism. Because, so before we got into that, I mean, one, of, one of the other things that I keep cautioning myself about it is you don't want to develop a way of seeing things that it's dramatically different, you know, it has nothing to do with the original spirit of Stoicism and then still call it Stoicism. That, that would that just yeah. not be helpful or fair, actually, to the thinkers we're talking about. So I, you can call something neo-Stoicism as long as it retains some, some relevant connections to, to the original idea. If it's entirely different, then, you know, forget it. Just come up with your own name. Now, what is it that, that, that Stoic thought in terms of sort of metaphysics, you're right that the, the physics is actually is essentially secondary. Uh, I think you hit it immediately uh, uh, the, the, what, what the problem is, which was a sort of teleology. I mean, the, the Stoics thought that there was an order to the world which some interpreted as essentially a divine order. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk in Stoicism of Zeus, uh, by whom, by the way, that didn't mean the kind of, um, you know, sort of debauchery-prone uh, simplistic God uh, that most other Greeks actually believed in. They they really thought it, they were essentially monotheistic. The, the, the Stoics were, for all effective purposes, monotheists. In fact, even more monotheist, arguably, than the Christians, uh, since they didn't believe in you know angels and, and, and uh, saints and things like that. Um, so, but they, nonetheless, so Zeus as the originator of the world, Zeus as the planner of the world, right? The the the, the equivalent of. Um, almost of a deist conception of, 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 of the world, but, uh, you know, something that, in fact, I don't, you know, there was no sense in which Zeus was going to answer prayers or any, or petitions from the, from the, from, from humans. So it's almost a deist perception of, of the world, which frankly wouldn't be entirely incompatible with the way we, with what we know today. Because there, there's a number of people that I know of who are perfectly rational and consider themselves essentially deist. Uh, but I don't. I, I'm not. I, I'm an atheist, so I, I can't go down that, that route. What I can do, however, is to pick up on what I think is the, the basic spirit of the Stoics and still maintain most of what they meant without having to sort of talk about Zeus. So what this, it seems to me, and to, to scholars, you know, I'm not a, a Stoic scholar, but, but I, I obviously studied reading uh, uh, Stoics in scholarship, and it seems like it's a reasonable way of looking at things, to think that the Stoics were really interested in the idea that the universe is, first of all, deterministic. You know, it, there's this uh, causal and effect uh, right. relationship among things that happen. So you know, things happen, uh, it, it, they may or may not happen for a reason. I mean, if you talk about, it, obviously, a Zeus or an intelligent uh, creator, then they happen for a reason. But if, it, at the very least, they happen because they, they, they're determined to happen by cause and effect relationship, which is something that anybody with a modern view of science can definitely get on board. But it's more than that. It's that the universe seems to be structured logically. There is, there is a, a logical, mathematical structure to things. And you don't need to think that that logical, mathematical structure was imposed by an intelligent creator to appreciate it. Uh, right. you know, in fact, all of modern science is based on the idea that the universe does work logically and mathematically. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to comprehend it. Yeah. Um, so, as such, I think that what, what, I, what I personally can take 
uh, from the Stoic metaphysics is this idea that things happen with, uh, uh, with cause and effect relationships and that they happen following a logical mathematical structure uh, of, which is inherent in, in reality. I can definitely be on board with that. Um, now, if you're going to then start asking me, well, where that, that, where that, is that the logic structure, logical mathematical structure comes from, I, ha I will have to be agnostic. Uh, I don't think it comes from a, an intelligent designer, but, yeah. but I don't have any, a, a particularly good answer to that question. I mean, it, I have to take it at the moment. Uh, you know, as you know, because we talked about this in the past, I've kind of flirted actually back and forth with even with things like mathematical Platonism, which is a position that can be adopted from a naturalistic perspective. You don't have to think that God created the universe mathematically. Yeah. So, so that's the basic, the basic take that I have about stoic um, sort of metaphysics that I think can work, uh, you know, I can work with as a modern, as a, as a philosopher living in the 21st century without feeling like I'm rejecting a fun, fun, fundamental uh, part of what the stoics were, were doing, and, but, but at the same time without having to talk about Zeus. Yeah, well, let, let's, let, me, let me just uh, talk about that for a minute. Um, sure. Because it seems to me that... Um, there's a fundamental mistake that, that modern philosophy has made, and that is that the, the, in assuming that if you get rid of the, the, the personified deities or even the even the deist sort of construed deities, that you also have to get rid of the concept of purpose, or the concept of telos. Right. And the reason I asked about what is it about the Stoic metaphysics that's incompatible with contemporary ways of looking at things is because if one is looking to a system to provide sort of um, a, a whole picture of, of life and, not, and, and guidance in life, I don't see how any system could do that that eschewed the concept of purpose from its explanatory framework. In other words, at a minimum, it would have to have uh, at least a minimalistically construed notion of purpose. And I know that we talked in one of our previous dialogues, you said that you'd actually tr been trying to reintroduce the concept of purpose into some sort of respectability in contemporary biology. Um, well, it's, it's not just me. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. you can argue that, uh, that ever since Darwin, really, we, we had a co concept of teleology, not purpose necessarily, but, but teleology as in, understood as function. So, you know, it makes perfect, except in any, in any other, so this, this, is, this applies only to biology, not to any other, other science that I know of, at least at the moment. But in biology, unlike in other sciences, it makes perfect sense to say, well, what is that for? Yeah. So if I ask, if I ask you, well, what, what are the eyes for? Uh, you have already answered. I mean, they have a, because they have a, they have a function. But if I ask you, what are asteroids for? Uh, you'd say, like, what does that mean? Uh, there, there's no, there, we can't make sense of the, of the question in when it comes to physics or chemistry or geology, but we can very much, uh, in fact, we cannot avoid, but making sense of that question uh, within biology. Now, of course, Darwin uh, suggested that the, the origin, the ultimate origin of that sense of function, of that function, and therefore that sense of sort of purpose of uh, biological structure is natural selection um, as a creative nature, a, a creative agent, essentially, within biology. Right. Now, do we need more than that? Um, well, as you know, some philosophers recently have been making noises in that direction, like mm -hmm. Thomas Nagel uh, has written this controversial uh, book yeah. about you know, reintroducing, about the fact that, that modern science itself lacks a robust notion of sort of purpose and teleology. He was talking not just about biology, but also you know, more broadly about physics, um, yeah. and so our entire understanding of the world. Um, I, quite frankly, I didn't see Nagel going into any particularly uh, sort of uh, creative direction because he didn't, he, he, you know, he pointed out a problem, and we may or may not agree that there is a problem there, but even if we do agree that there is a problem for modern science in that sense, he certainly didn't have any particular suggestion of where to go with it. Now, there are even more speculative um, uh, options that have been put out there, like Nick Bostrom's idea of a simulated universe, right? So... Uh, he has proposed that uh, the reason um, this, this universe looks so coherent and logical and mathematical and all that, it's because it is. Uh, it's because it's, it's actually a simulation that's been run by uh, somebody else in a, you know, in, a, in a broader universe. And so we are actually you know, in a video game, essentially, or something like along those lines. Interestingly, some physicists and mathematicians have gone that direction as well. I mean, Max, I've interviewed Max Tegmark uh, not long ago for the, for the Rationally Speaking podcast, and you know, he's, he's 
definitely on board with that sort of view, although he doesn't come at it from a, a philosophical perspective, he thinks. <laughs> he comes at it from a sort of a more cosmolo cosmological, mathematical perspective. So th these ideas are out there. Now, obviously, those ideas would directly reintroduce um, the idea of teleology at a very fundamental level. And in fact, uh, kind of ironically, I think those ideas are even more compatible with Stoicism than my own. Because at that point, you do have Zeus, or, or the equivalent of Zeus. Right? Yeah, that's if, interesting. If the, yeah, if the universe is mathematically designed by somebody for in a simulation, uh, then, hey, yes, somebody must have designed that simulation. Now, Tegmark, by the way, doesn't actually necessarily imply an intelligent designer. Bostrom, Bostrom does. Uh, and, of course, that intelligent designer doesn't have to be divine at all. Uh, but nonetheless, that, that kind of idea, so the Bostrom's idea, it's much more similar or more in line, I would say, with the uh, Stoic metaphysics than my own. I, I'm not going that far. It, it, but as far as those I, ideas are concerned, I find them interesting uh, to sort of think about, especially over a glass of wine. Uh, but I, 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 don't, I just don't feel compelled to introduce them, introduce them seriously as a, as, a, as a part of my uh, own philosophical system. I think I can be agnostic uh, or generally interested, but not buying into those ideas uh, and I don't particularly suffer. I don't see my, my way of looking at things suffering particularly. Uh, I can, as I said a, a few minutes ago, just start out with acknowledging, you know, agreeing with the Stoics that there is a fundamental, logical, mathematical structure to the universe and that things unfold in the universe according to causal relationships. And that's all I need to really recover, in my mind, you know, 90% of what the Stoics were talking about. Yeah, because it gives you this sort of notion of intelligibility and... and and structure and form. Um, I, I guess that, you know, it's funny that the stuff you're talking about sounds like science fiction. And um, <laughs> I guess I just think it's all really unnecessary. Um, I, I think in a sense, there's been a lot of mistakes that have compounded, compounded on top of one another. Um, you know, you don't need to reintroduce teleology into physics in order to be able to make the sense of make sense of the idea of purpose in one's life, right? And um, it seems to me that the, the areas and, or the levels of description at which we really need to invoke purposes are at the social level, the political level. Um, at the the lowest I could ever think of us needing them would be at the biological level, and that's only maybe with respect to the meaning of one's life in light of one's mortality, the sort of the significance of mortality. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, the idea that somehow I can't have those kinds of purposes without going back and having purposes in physics, I think, is actually, interestingly, a mistake that both the hardcore atheist science crowd and the very religious crowd yeah. make. Yeah. Right? They both make the same error. Yeah, I, I would agree. And in fact, again, one of the reasons I find uh, I, myself more and more sort of fascinated by Stoicism is because, in a sense, they have a very modern view of, of things, because again, they, they, they thought that we live in a deterministic universe, you know, forget about who or what put it, you know, got it started to begin with, but we live in a deterministic, logically structured universe, so then the question that they had to face was, well, what am I going to do about it, in terms of, you know, sort of my life and, and how to conduct it, and so the Stoics made, were essentially, in, in modern terms, uh, modern philosophical terms, were essentially compatibilists about free will. Hmm. So those were the kinds of people that uh, that would think, like you just said a minute ago, that you know I don't need a uh, teleology at the fund at the foundational level in order to find meaning in my life. I make my meaning in my life, even though I realize that that the universe is in fact uh, the result of cause cause effect uh, interactions. So you own your meaning, you own your your uh, your life in the sense that you are the one who makes these decisions about how to go about it. And we all make the, I, I would hope that it's uncontroversial, that we all make decisions uh, in life. Whether those decisions were sort of fated to be that way from the beginning of the universe or not, I quite quite frankly, I think it's a relevant question. It's a red herring. It's I like, agree. You know, there are, it's, there are my decisions because I make them as, as a, as a, a, a cognitive uh, uh, being capable of doing exactly that, or making the, or reflecting on things and making decisions. So yeah. that's all I need in order to construct meaning in my life and, and, and ownership of, of my life. No, I really like that. And, and um, maybe this is a good place at which to have, have you talk about the neo-Stoicism, what right. this looks like um, in, in, in its details. Um, I really like this idea that of, of, in a sense, a philosophy of life that's immune 
to the determinist critique in a way that the Judeo Christian is is the opposite. Right. It's very vulnerable to it, right? Right. The, the Judeo Christian requires a substantially uh, libertarian conception of freedom of the will, at least in many of its incar their incarnations. Uh, and I like this idea of kind of uh, uh, an equally ancient philosophy that is somewhat immune to this uh, problem That's right. that then can be modernized and updated in such a way that it, it can be uh, uh, useful in the contemporary world. And speaking of utility, uh, as a, we mentioned, you know, sort of half an hour ago, there are connections uh, between stoic practice and uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. And if there is one thing that we know about cognitive behavioral therapy, it is that it's, it's one of the few types of psychotherapy that actually does work in terms of sort of actually altering and, and for the better uh, human behavior, so and which is why the Stoicism, uh, uh, the Stoic Week um, project, uh, is collecting data. And by the way, they've d been doing this now for a number of years about Stoic practice and uh, the preliminary results, uh, which I just jo saw an article uh, recently, just a, a couple of weeks ago, about the preliminary results are not surprisingly, in my mind, positive, meaning that people who do engage in, in Stoic practice. Uh, do uh, seem to have a, a better um, uh, way of, of reacting to their, their own problems in life. They have, a, they own their their uh, uh, the way of doing things more, and they, they feel more confident. They feel more optimistic, actually, even though at the same time they feel they are more realistic about what they can and cannot do. I mean, one of the basic precepts of stoicism, for instance, is this. Um, uh, realization of the difference between what one can affect and what one cannot affect. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, most people are probably uh, familiar with the serenity prayer, which is used mm -hmm. in you know, modern Christianity, which goes back only to the 19th century. But the Stoics had essentially their own version of the serenity prayer, you know, 2,000 years ago. And, um, and they were making this, if you read Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus, they make this very interesting distinction. They say, look, uh, you, sh you should feel responsible and concerned about the kinds of things that you can do uh, and make a difference about. The rest is, you know, it's up to the, to, to the rest of humanity and to the rest of the universe. And if you can't do anything about it, there's no sense in getting upset about it. Uh, so in, the, in this sense, the Stoics are often accused of being fatalistic, you know, sort of a, a passive and accepting the way things are. But that's actually a very uh, uh, deep misconception of Stoicism. Uh, which it kind of it's kind of surprising because if you think about it, many of the best best known Stoics, especially the in the Pope Roman political leaders, yeah, right, especially <laughs> in, you know ancient Rome, they were you know we're talking emperors, senators, you know generals, you know that sort of stuff. I mean these were these are people who definitely were not passive in the face right. of events. On the contrary, but what what the Stoics meant was that you know you do the best that you can to uh, affect society for the best, but ultimately you're responsible only for your own character, only for your own decisions not for how things turn out. Uh, the, 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 the Stoics made a big basic distinction between cultivating the virtues, uh, you know, in other words, cultivating your own character, which was the, the, uh, the goal of life, in, in life. You know, that, that was what they were supposed to be uh, focusing on, uh, developing your own character in order to become a good person. That's, that's up to you, according to the Stoics, and so that's how you're going to be judging whether you've got a eudaimonic life, you know, good life or not. But outside of that, they uh, made another interesting distinction between what they called in, uh, indifference. So the indifference are, is, is are everything that is not your character, anything that doesn't deal with your virtues, right? So whether I'm rich or poor, whether I'm healthy or, or, or sick, uh, whether I'm famous or, or unknown, it, it, those are all indifference. And meaning that they do not make a difference for your character, for who you are as a person. And I think actually, if you think about it, most people, well, I don't know about most people, but you know, a number of people today would, I would agree with that. I mean, it's not, the fact that you're rich or poor uh, has very little to do with your own, with the value of your character. I mean, you wouldn't presumably go out to somebody just because he's rich and say, oh, you're a good person. Uh, right. Or just because you're poor, oh, you're a bad person, right? We we think that those are essentially orthogonal. I mean, there are there are some connections, but they're essentially logically at least orthogonal. Um, but the the Stoics call these indifference, and that is a, a common source of of another misunderstanding about Stoicism, which is well, if they're indifferent, that that does that mean that I shouldn't care about it? And the answer is no, because the Stoics then then distinguish these indifference in uh, preferred and non-preferred. And 
you know, at first sight, you say, what do you mean a preferred indifferent? If it's indifferent, you, you, it doesn't make any sense to prefer it. And if you prefer it, it's obviously not indifferent. But you have to get into the sort of the stoic way of looking at things. So a preferred indifferent, for instance, is being healthy as opposed to being sick. Uh, a preferred indifference is indifferent is being educated as opposed to being ignorant. A preferred indifferent is being, you know, uh, having means to pursue your life goals as opposed to not having those means and so on and so right. forth. The point is, all of those are preferred, but they do not make you who you are. They don't constitute the, the essential part of your character. They don't make you a good or a bad person. In that sense, and in only in that sense, they're indifferent, not in the sense that they're not to be preferred. Which brings me back to the social activism of Stoicism. Unlike Epicureanism, and unlike, frankly, I would say, Buddhism, uh, Stoicism was very much a social philosophy. In fact, many Stoics referred to it as a philosophy of love. Love for other human beings and love for humankind uh, in, at large. The, the, the Stoics uh, were very much into... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that you should should enlarge the, the, the circle of things, of people for whom you, you have concern, first to your family and friends, and then to your fellow citizens, and then to your nation, and then eventually to the whole of, of humankind, in other words, to all rational beings. And in fact, some of them, the late Stoics also would say, uh, to nature as a, as a whole. Uh, they call that the, the notion of philanthropy, which didn't have, of course, the meaning that it has today. It's not. It's not about giving money to charity. Uh, it's about feeling a lot love uh, for all all beings, especially all rational beings, but in general, all nature. So, philosophy is uh, sorry. Stoicism is very much a philosophy of active social involvement and of emotions, positive emotions. Uh, yet that's yet another uh, stereotype about Stoicism that there was an emotional and cold. That wasn't the issue at all. The Stoics were interested in controlling the negative emotions. Uh, when you get upset, for instance, about how something has turned out, uh, or because somebody is treating you in a certain way, uh, for the Stoic, you're just you're wasting your energy, uh, your your psychic energy. You're just you're getting upset about something that really doesn't touch you as a person. It doesn't affect your character. And anyway, at any rate, you can't do anything about it because it has already happened. So that that kind of emotion, you need to sort of develop uh, ways to control it. But that's not to say that you don't have positive emotions, love being the, 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 the chief one. So it's, it's a really interesting, really intricate philosophy. The more you get into it, the more you say, wow, these people really have thought quite a bit about, about what they were doing and, and, and how to put it in practice in, in life. Actually, now that, that you know that you described it this way, you described it really very nicely. It is very different from Aristotle in yes. the sense that um, one of the things I noticed right away is that Aristotle actually gives much greater uh, credit to external factors right. uh, and to fortune in with respect to one's flourishing. Aristotle says, you know, even if you live what seems to be an, 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 an outwardly successful life in every regard. Um, your descendants can undermine it, such right. that it retroactively means you never flourished. Right. Um, and what? certainly, of course, the, the modern utilitarians, um, the extent to, given the extent to which you can't control all the ripple effect outcomes of your actions, the goodness of your own actions are mm -hmm. hostage to a lot of forces that are beyond your control. That's right. And it and, and actually... The more you describe it, I was actually thinking that there may be a lot of co more connections between Stoicism and Kant yes. that we give credit for. Because right. Kant, one of the reasons that Kant uh, dismisses outcomes as morally relevant is because he really doesn't think we have all that much control over the outcomes. That's right. Um, there are just too many variables that play into what the outcomes of an action are uh, for us to really control it and for thus for it to really uh, be a justifiable consideration. Right. And what we do, what he really says is, you know, attend to your own will. Right. Um, and, as, and, 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 I, but I've never right. heard Stoicism mentioned in the discussion of Kant, unless I'm, just, I'm not up on my reading. No, no, you, you're, it's, it's unusual, but actually there is a little bit of scholarship uh, of, sort of, of uh, Stoicism that, that reinterprets it or makes connections, as you just suggested, uh, to, to Kant, precisely for the reasons that, uh, that you're talking about. But, you know, one of the things then that, that, that I find interesting about Stoicism is also the fact that it's very much a practice. I mean, I've been now practicing as a Stoic, uh, sort of, quote-unquote, um, 
for a number of weeks. This is, this is very recent, by the way. This, 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 this development is very recent. Could you describe uh, what that involves, practicing yeah. as a Stoic? Yes. So, so there are, uh, as I said, people that are interested can uh, obviously read my, my article in uh, Scientia Salon, which does have a sort of a general uh, overview of the whole thing. But it also is uh, more to the point you can download um, this, this manual for being a Stoic, essentially, from the Stoic, uh, Stoicism Today uh, website. We, these, these are the people at Exeter University who are responsible for Stoic Week. Um, right. But basically, here it is. So, so I start my day with the morning meditation. And the meditation, the term meditation in, um, in Stoicism is very, very different uh, from the equivalent term in, in Buddhism. Uh, while Buddhism is about, uh, essentially, what I would say, really mindlessness as opposed to mindfulness. I mean, I know that, that Buddhists do use the, the term mindfulness, but... This, the, my, the Buddhist meditation, which I have practiced uh, a number of years ago, uh, for a little bit, is really about emptying your mind. You know, sort of don't you know get your thoughts out of the way and sort of get into this 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 uh, very calm, very tranquil space. For the Stoic, it's exactly the opposite. You want to focus your mind on whatever the challenges of the day uh, ahead are. So the morning meditation uh, is about visualizing uh, your day. And, and, uh, and preparing for the challenges by specifically listing what is it that you're going to be having to deal with today and which one of the virtues uh, or which ones of the virtues you will need to draw on in order to uh, assess those, those, those uh, challenges, to, to, to take on those challenges. The virtues, by the way, the Stoics, um, uh, different, uh, different Stoic authors had different lists of, of the basic virtues. Uh, Aristotle, which of course was not a Stoic, had 12 different you know, virtues, and, and uh, so it depends on who you ask. Well, but if, for all effective purposes, Stoicism really is based on the four so-called four cardinal virtues. And these are, um, uh, you know, self-control, uh, wisdom, uh, courage, uh, and justice, or equanimity. And so you begin the, the, the morning meditation that way. Um, then you also uh, do something called the, um, you know, visualizing sort of the, 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 the big picture, the, the, the view from, from above. You literally, you close your eyes and you think of yourself first as an individual and then as a, a, an individual, a member of a large society and then a member of uh, that society as part of a, of a broader nation and then nation as part of a broader uh, planet, uh, planetary uh, population, and then you, if you want, if you can zoom even out there in the solar system, the galaxy, the, the, local, uh, the local group, the idea is to put yourself in perspective, that you are a very little cog in a, in a huge uh, universal mechanism uh, or ensemble. What's the, aim, what's the aim of that particular step? Is that to sort of instill a kind of humility in what one right. does? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Is that you're not the center of the universe or the world or, the, or, or even you know, the, your, your, your own city. So you, you need to be a, a, a looking at things from a certain detached perspective, essentially. Um, so that's the second thing you do in the, in the morning meditation. By the way, the whole thing that lasts, my morning meditation lasts only you know, about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes at most. The third thing you're supposed to be doing is the premeditatio malorum, uh, which, uh, or actually I should say premeditatio to, to use the correct Latin. That is, uh, you visualize a really bad thing happening to you today. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, you, you ask yourself, uh, for instance, wh what would happen if today all of a sudden I was injured seriously and I had, you know, went to the hospital or, uh, or if I became poor? Or if I lost my job, or if my if I lost my relationship, uh, or, or or a dear friend, or even if that, of course, uh, if you die. And the idea of this is not to get in a broody mood, or you know, it's like oh crap, something like that could happen. In fact, it's sort of the opposite. <laughs> it's like it, it, you visualize it, and and then you say, okay, so that's really not as bad as is it? You know, it, it's not it's not going to affect my character. It's not going to affect who I am as a person. It cannot change who I am as a person, and therefore it's indifferent. Indifferent in the sense of earlier described, not in the sense that it doesn't matter whether you're alive or, or dead or whether you're in the hospital or not. But it's indifferent to your moral character, and therefore it's much less impactful than you might think of. By the way, this particular technique is very well developed in cognitive behavioral therapy to deal with depression. And yeah. it is actually uh, apparently somewhat effective in doing so. So that's the third thing. The final, the final thing that I do in the morning meditation uh, is to pick um, a Stoic saying uh, from one of the classic authors. 
I have developed, as, as, as I go with my readings, I've developed sort of my own database. I have a spreadsheet of, of quotations, which actually at some point I'll, I might publish so that other people can use it. I was going to say you should yeah. publish that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going through a few more, and then, I, and then I'll probably uh, put it out there. But um, so you pick one of those, uh, and you know they, they, they tend to be very short phrases, and you sort of you, you reflect on it. You, you repeat it three or four times, and then you reflect on it into, on the meaning of it. Um, and you know these these phrases can be uh, very uh, again from from the classic writers like Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, and it typically have to do with basic uh, Stoic precepts, such as the idea that um, uh, you know everything is conditional to uh, fate permitting. Uh, everything is as the conditional clause uh, of stoicism, or that um, you know, reminding yourself that uh, that you're just one person among many, and you're not inherently more important than than anybody else. You're not the focus of, of of all the events. You're just one among many, and so on and so forth. There there are several that are uh, that are very that I find very useful. So once you've done that, you go about your day, and what you're supposed to be doing during your day is to be mindful again. Not in the Buddhist sense of the term, but in the sense of paying, really paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, being very much in the moment. Um, the Stoics used um, this classic Latin phrase, ik et nunc, which means here and now. That is, you, you're not supposed to be dwelling on your, on your past, because your past is gone, done. So it, there's nothing you can do about it. So, you know, uh, uh, feeling bad about something done in the past is not helpful. Uh, you're not supposed to be dwelling too much into the future either, because the future is not here yet. Now, of course, you take action now, presumably to, towards certain goals. It's not like it's not ignoring the future, but you don't you don't worry too much about it. The only thing you can worry about is what you're doing right now, and you have to constantly pay attention to what you're doing, and also, at least from time to time during the day, ask yourself whether what you're doing is making things better in general for you know other people. I remember the, the connection that I said early, early on about Stoicism being a very much of, of a sort of socially oriented philosophy. I'm sure our audience uh, will notice, Massimo, that uh, we're wearing different clothing that you seem to have transported <laughs> to a different location. Yeah. Uh, we had some technical issues in the last uh, portion of our uh, dialogue. And um, we could have left it, but I, I really, Massimo, I really thought the conversation was so interesting and so rel and so relevant to to a lot of uh, people's interests that I thought we should we should we should re-record the end. And so um, we need to sort of catch up ourselves, even though the audience doesn't need to catch up on where we were. Right, Massimo, you just given a really interesting account of uh, your daily regimen practicing uh, what you're calling neo stoicism. Right. You described to me a, a morning meditation that included three three basic elements. This uh, what you called a view from above, where you imagine your relative place uh, uh, in society, the world, and the larger universe, and understand that you're a small part in a larger system. The next was that you try to visualize a terrible thing happening to you um, <laughs> right. that day, and it helps you to sort of realize that even the worst things aren't so bad, and and more importantly that a lot of those bad things don't really affect your character and don't really affect, shouldn't affect the, the sort of the choices and the decisions you make and the way you feel on, on a daily basis. Exactly. To, to use the stoic um, uh, sort of way of phrasing it, those would be dispreferred <laughs> indifference. Right, right, right. So Which you don't you like them, but they don't really affect your character, who you right. are as a person. And you have defined that. So I want to ask you to define it again, um, at least but not at this moment. And um, the last one was, you pick a Stoic saying from the classic uh, Stoic writers, and the idea is to sort of connect with fundamental Stoic principles. Right. Um, you also said that in your in the conducting of your daily business, um, you really focus on the here and now. The past can't be changed, and the future, though it does hold our goals and our ends, is not here yet. That's right. Um, uh, and so I thought that this was really interesting, and what I wanted to ask you about it was um, – it does, though, strike me as quite intellectual, and um, <laughs> you and, think? <laughs> well, and I don't, I don't actually mean that in, in 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 a in a disparaging way. I mean it more in the sense that it really comes from the intellect, um, and we're talking about neo stoicism as a whole philosophy of life, not just as uh, part of your sort of intellectual uh, 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 furniture, right? And I'm I, I'm curious, what is the mechanism? by which stoicism expects the emotions to come along for the ride. In other words, 
for example, two of the three things that you list in your <clears throat> daily regimen, one of them being this view from above and the other one being this visualization of a terrible idea, you know, I can definitely see the benefits of, of doing these, but I can also see them having really quite negative effects. The view from above, on the one hand, can produce a kind of healthy humility, but on the other hand, I could see it producing a sense of hopelessness. Right. Um, it's indeed this idea that one is a tiny piece of a giant universe is exactly what many theists are trying to resist yes. in focusing on this idea that God chose man, made man, and man is the center of his attention and all this sort of thing. Um, and with the visualization of a terrible thing happening, on the one hand, I can see it having the effect you describe. But on the other hand, especially in today's sort of very hypochondriac kind of age, an anxiety-laden age, right. I could see a lot of people that causing them to obsess. I guess what I'm asking is, does what you're describing really require that a person already have a well, relatively well-adjusted temperament? And then the question is, well, what was the philosophy of life that got you to that point of well-adjustedness such that you can now benefit from the Stoic, Stoicist regimen? Right. Well, th those are excellent questions. Uh, so first of all, let's remember that the, the idea, of course, that I'm proposing is that some people might benefit from a Stoic practice. Not everybody necessarily will, right? Th this goes for pretty much any practice, any approach yes, uh, to life. Uh, you know, the, the, the obvious uh, sort of parallel there is Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism has been as a practice, even as a secular practice, not just as, not, not necessarily a religious one, has been useful and, and is uh, being useful to an, a large number of people. But of course, it's not everybody's cup of tea. There are some people like myself, for instance, uh, who have tried, you know, Buddhist meditations and meditation and just that, you know, it doesn't do what it is supposed to do. I mean, it, yes, it does calm me down, but it also makes me kind of wanted to go back to my books and read and, and actually occupy my mind instead of emptying it. Right. So, so yeah, so on the one hand, you're absolutely right. Uh, there may very well be a certain kinds of people for which a stoic approach works and others that, that, that doesn't. That's an empirical question. And, and all I'm suggesting is that people give it a try or at least start, you know, read about it. And it, it may be their cup of tea. Now, the other thing is, however, uh, it is also the case that unlike a lot of other practices um, and, and unlike a lot of certainly a lot of other philosophies, uh, Stoic does have a strong parallel uh, with some psychotherapeutic uh, practice that actually does have it, it is in fact empirically based and it's, it's, it's evidence based, particularly, right. you know, kind of the behavioral therapy um, and, uh, and, and similar uh, kinds of approaches. Now, kind of the behavioral therapy works very much like Stoic practice and it's not a, not by chance. That's because it was influenced very uh, very strongly, uh, especially its uh, onset by Stoic practice, by a knowledge of Stoic practice. So, uh, and, and and it has been used. It, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is used for depressed people for treating depression. Uh, it is being used for uh, sort of re general reorientation of negative emotions, which brings me to the next. And it seems to work, incidentally. Uh, the, the, uh, which brings me to the to the uh, important point that. It is unfortunate, I think, that stoicism is often associated with uh, sort of too much intellectualism and too little emotion. Um, because although it certainly is a philosophy, and it's a it's a it's a well-rounded philosophy. It's definitely there is quite a bit of sort of intellectual thinking that goes on into you know into this into the, the the whole idea. But it is supposed actually to be, according to even to the Stoics themselves, the ancient Stoics themselves. It's supposed to be actually a philosophy of love. It's supposed to be a philosophy of, you know, Epictetus is explicit about it, uh, for instance, and, and, and so is Marcus Aurelius. Uh, it's supposed to be a philosophy not of, of um, sort of downgrading or controlling your emotions, but um, by making a distinction between positive and negative emotions and uh, working on the negative ones so that they don't become so destructive and working on the positive ones so that they are enhanced and they become more dominant um, in your life. Basically, the Stoics say that um, uh, when emotions, you know, it, it is impossible to avoid being emotionally affected by something. This is just human, being a human, uh, 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 human being. Uh, right. You know, the emotions come. And, um, and, you know, and you're affected by them. But then the stoic idea is that then you can also uh, essentially consider the emotion and, and decide uh, whether with practice, whether you want to give, give it assent or not. So the idea is like, okay, I, I'm getting angry, for instance. Uh, you know, I'm reacting to something. I, I, this, 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 uh, whatever somebody's saying or somebody's doing is making me angry, and, and I can feel the anger uh, well up inside me. Now, uh, as a Stoic, I can. I have now trained 
to recognize that and I know what to do about it. I am going to uh, observe it, let it cool down. Uh, if I need to take a walk or, a, or, or count until 10 before I answer or, or, or you know, wait an hour before I respond to that email that made, made me so angry and so on and so forth, I know how to do it and I know how to do it because of, of, a, of a practice, everyday practice. And that makes me uh, better able, able to, ha to, to handle a, an emotion that will probably be destructive. And again, this is very much like cognitive behavioral therapy. At the same time, however, uh, stoicism is also about uh, sort of fostering and, and, and nurturing positive emotions. Uh, there's this idea of the, of the stoic circle, for instance, uh, a series of circles, uh, where you start by uh, acknowledging the natural uh, love and affection that you have for your friends and your family, and then gradually think of uh, other human beings as being brought into the circle. So first you think of people that live in your same city, and then people that, think, that live in your... Uh, same state, and then eventually you, you sort of en enlarge the circle of affection, the circle of love um, to the entire planet or, in fact, to nature itself. This is not really that different from, you know, Peter Singer's, who is a utilitarian, of course, yeah. not a, not a uh, stoic, but Peter Singer's idea that we can, we can rationally begin to expand that circle of concern, and then, however, the more we do it, the more it becomes a habit, this is also an Aristotelian idea, if you will, that you practice virtue and you become virtuous, which again is, yeah. is something that is very much in, uh, uh, applied in kind of behavioral therapy. So these, these things, I think, do work um, for the people that respond to, uh, to them uh, because it isn't just a matter of, of sort of cognition and intellectualism. It's also a matter of practice. It's very much a matter of practice and it's very much a matter of reorienting uh, negative and positive um, emotions. So, again, you know, it, this isn't uh, to say that it's going to work for everybody, but it seems to be working for me. I mean, I'll let you know. I mean, I just started, so <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Uh, no, and I'm not at all suggesting that you're proselytizing or anything. <laughs> um, um, and what you just said is really interesting. Actually, more than Singer, what you just described to me reminds me a lot of Hume um, because of the whole idea of that that the, sort of the natural instinct is to to care the most about those who are closest and but but that via the imagination we're able to extend that sympathy to people uh, even whom we don't know um and um that that's sort of at the heart or at the basis of uh of of justice right that's the right. virtue of justice yes. um it also reminds me and i think maybe part of the answer to me to my question is to suggest that maybe i'm perhaps artificially uh, and not not that I'm doing this, but that this is a very modern predilection to artificially uh, separate the intellect from the emotions. The right. Greeks never would have made such a distinction. Right. And Aristotle himself says that you really don't have the virtue, on the relevant moral virtue, until um, you sort of feel it, right? Until yes. until you get pleasure from it. Yes. Until you that that's the sign that you actually really have it. That's right. Uh, and aren't just and aren't just. Um, intellectualizing it. And that's right. And actually, the, an interesting point uh, here to make is that although you're right that sort of a lot of modern philosophy, especially a lot of, of modern, uh, you know, moral philosophy would definitely make a major distinction between sort of the, the emotions and, and, and the like that. You know, and, and analytic philosophy itself is based on, a, it's a very intellectual kind of pursuit. But not only the ancients wouldn't make that sort of distinction, uh, that sort of, I would say, they knew better. But even modern neurobiology shows us that that's a bad distinction to make. Uh, it, right. You know, it's, it's it's very well understood now that it yes, it is certainly the case that you know that there are different areas of the brain that are largely in charge of sort of emotional reactions like the amygdala uh, versus you know higher level thinking you know sort of uh, uh, executive thinking in the frontal lobes. But it's also very obvious from neurobiology that every normal human being you know unless you're a psychopath. Um, has a constant dialogue between these areas of the brain. There is constantly feedback going back and forth between the two so that it's, even though you can sort of locate them anatomically, you cannot actually distinguish them functionally because it's, it's all one thing that mediates constantly uh, back and forth. And that is, I think, in sync with the ideas of the, of the ancient Greeks much more than it, than it is with the idea of some sort of analytic philosophers of, you know, contemporary nature. Yeah, it's, it's funny how many different 
themes have evolved over the several discussions you and I have had. Um, you know, I'm starting to wonder whether we should do a dialogue entirely on ancient versus modern philosophy because not a bad now, idea. <laughs> now, on several occasions, I think we found places where the the modern philosophy is actually not an improvement on the on the ancient. Right. Last time, it had to do with uh, conceptions of explanation. And today it has to do with almost these pictures of the ways of thinking of the, the human uh, psychological template. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and that's really fascinating to me. Um, the, the last thing that we had discussed uh, before when, when we had the technical glitches and I didn't realize that we weren't recording that I wanted to talk to you about um, was something that occurred to me while I was reading uh, your post on Stoicism and Ciencio Salon. Yeah. And this may be due to the fact that I um, – was over my attention was overly drawn to your dramatic uh, uh, remark about needing to prepare for your own death. Right. But it almost seemed to me when I was reading this that what you really were looking for was some sort of a modern, secular, acceptable replacement for a traditional religion. Um, that in a sense, uh, this the whole idea of a philosophy of life is in a sense a, re a religion that's palatable to a modern person uh who is unwilling to make certain uh sorts of commitments mostly supernatural um but i, I i'm wondering now if that's actually true if that's what you were looking for no i don't think that's what i was looking for if i were to look for something like that uh, as you know the, 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 there are things like that available uh things like you know the ethical culture for instance you know, society for ethical culture or uh, even Unitarians or, you know, or things like that. There, there are outlets like that which very much uh, model themselves after a uh, organized religion of some sort. I mean, uh, it's, it's, you can see the same things. You know, they, they meet in a building that looks very much like a church or it's structured very much like a church. Uh, they do actually often that on Sunday mornings, uh, not, not by chance. Uh, they have things like uh, they sing and they... Um, uh, talk to each other in a sort of in a positive uh, fashion. They inst they don't listen to a sermon, but they do listen to a sort of a lecture or a talk that has typically ethical, uh, you know, uh, ethical content. Um, and and then they share a meal, you know. So there's this this kind of you know they have a separate thing for kids. It's really like a church. And did, you, did you try? Did you try this yourself? Yeah, yeah, I did. And uh, for instance, for some time, and I was uh, living in Brooklyn, right around the corner from. Uh, uh, one of the uh, nice buildings for the for the of the ethical culture, and and I tried it. And I said, okay, this is, this may be a good thing. Let's see what happens. Let's bring my daughter there. It didn't work. It was just not our uh, cup of tea. And in fact, it doesn't work. I would say in general, I have nothing at all against ethical culture or Unitarians and so on and so forth. In fact, I often actually go to the local ones when I'm invited to give a talk, so to, to give the equivalent of their sermon. Um, but no, it doesn't work for me. And I think it doesn't work for a lot of people precisely because it feels too far too much like a religion. It, it really feels like a religion without, however, the, the, the transcendental, uh, that is going to guarantee that, uh, you're going to live forever and you're going to be, and, and then if there is any wrong in this, in this world is going to be rectifying the next one and you know, that sort of stuff, which is of course a major reason I think why people embrace a, um, a religion. Now there is the social aspect of it. Uh, that is true. Um, but that doesn't seem to be enough. And, and you can see that by the fact that um, organizations like Ethical Culture and Unitarians are not particularly successful so in terms of numbers. Uh, and, you know, that they're very, very much a niche uh, kind of operation. So that was not what I was looking for uh, because I looked into, into it and it just didn't work for me. But what I was looking for was some kind of uh, broad, coherent philosophy and practice that would help me make sense of my life and or better sense of my life and of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and so on and so forth. Now, to some extent, I've been building that and I've been searching for that for, you know, decades. Uh, and especially over the last few years where my interest in philosophy has gotten more, uh, more obvious and more, more prominent. Uh, and my first uh, stop there, you know, so I tried, for instance, I looked at, in, into a couple of different things. The, the obvious one was Aristotle. Uh, so, so Aristotle's idea of cultivating the virtues, Aristotle's idea of the eudaimonia, the, 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 the life, the good life, the good moral life, actually has a lot of appeal to me. And uh, I, I consciously tried to model uh, certain aspects of my life after um, Aristotle and, and, and sort of similar approaches. And that was kind of okay, but it wasn't really part, it really didn't give me the idea that this was part of an overall um, sort of coherent approach 
to to things. It was like it, it felt a little bit a little bit of hazard. Uh, I also then in, uh, looked into uh, Epicurus, uh, and Epicureanism is very similar, in fact, in certain respects to uh, Stoicism. Uh, uh, that the Epicureanism was the major rival school uh, of uh, um, of the Stoics uh, at the, at the time in Hellenistic Greece and then in uh, in ancient Rome. Uh, but Epicureanism does not, although actually it is a much more of a doctrine, it is much more of a coherent approach than, than what Aristotle was writing about. Um, uh, it really didn't feel like a good match. And it didn't feel like a good match for the simple reason that Epicureanism is in certain respects a lot like Buddhism. It does in fact actively practice uh, 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 practices uh, sort of detachment from society you don't, you know, for an Epicurean, uh, there is no sense in getting involved in politics or, for instance, or in social change because it's not going to happen. It's very likely you're going to very likely going to be disappointed. Um, and so it's very much an inward looking philosophy to some extent, although for different reasons, I think Buddhism is as well. Yeah. Stoicism, on the other hand, is the opposite. I mean, think about the, you know the major Stoics were all yeah. you know emperors and and generals and senators and you know these 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 were people that very much tried to and in some cases succeeded in, in yeah. changing the world. So it, philosophy, uh, so Stoicism is very much a philosophy of action, uh, as much as it is a philosophy of of love and of emotions. <laughs> And so it, it sort of it, it resonated better and better, and it's on at some point I decided, well, why don't we make the the, the take the, the leap and instead of just reading about it, and instead of just you know sort of pondering the different uh, varieties of of uh, ancient philosophy, why don't why don't we try for a while, for a few weeks, uh, this idea of actually practicing as a Stoic, so practicing the morning meditation, the evening meditation, the mindfulness during the day, trying to achieve a flow uh, through uh, to your day, which is what um, um, Epictetus uh, and, and Chrysippus suggested. So. Uh, that, that's what, that's what brought me there. And, um, you know, everybody can do this, by the way, not only on their own, just, just, I've, I've, I've been doing it for a while, but also because once a year there is this, uh, uh, event organized by Exeter University in England, you know, Stoic Week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which we talked about. Right. Yeah, so that one, fascinating. that one is, you know, it allows you to, to be part of that experiment, uh, essentially. If you want to, if you want to help out, um, uh, collect data on Stoicism, that's, that's a good way to do it. It's a fun way to do it. Um, what kind of community is that? Is that what, what? What sorts of people have you found involved in the sort of demographically? Have you found involved? Are these people that that are refugees from traditional religions? Are these people who are atheists who are who have always been atheists but who now feel a need for greater meaningfulness and sort of consolation in their lives? What sort of people have you found there? Um, that that's group? a good question, and I don't have systematic data. I'm sure the people at Stoic Week actually do because they keep... What trying. are your impressions? Yeah, so I, I can get give you some impressions by uh, by the fact that I spend a, a little bit of time uh, every day on the on the Stoicism Today Facebook page, which is where their, their uh, sort of uh, social interactions happen, you know, basically, basically across the globe. And they tend to be, yeah, people tend to be secular in nature, although there are some religious people. There's, there's uh, a number of uh, significant connections between Stoicism and Christianity, for instance. So there yes. are some Christian people. There are some uh, people who are interested in Eastern uh, religions or practices um, that come at and want to compare you know, Buddhist versus Stoic meditation. So there's that. Uh, I do have the impression that it's mostly people uh, in their 30s, 40s, and beyond. And most of the contributors that I see there, unfortunately, are white males. There's not a lot of diversity there. Hmm. Um, uh, that I don't think it's the fault of the, of the Stoic Week uh, or the or the Stoicism Today um, uh, sort of effort. It it's just happens to be, you know, you, in order to get into Stoicism, Stoicism is not exactly like Buddhism. Uh, which is so popular now in the, it's so, so present in the popular culture in the United States. Uh, you know, very few people have not heard of Stoicism. And if you're not interested in ancient philosophy, you're unlikely to have heard of it. And, uh, you know, there's certain, there's entire demographics, as we know, that are not even, that are not particularly attracted by philosophy in general, let alone, uh, you know, ancient philosophy in particular. So, now, of course, I, as, I assume that people at um, the, the, the um, Stoicism Today project are aware of it and, and they're sort of trying to do some kind of outreach. Um, it would be nice to get to have more diversity in, in that sort of community. Now, in New York, uh, in particular, there is actually a Stoic meetup 
so there is a group of people who actually meet uh, in in person physically um, to sort of talk about stoicism and and uh, compare notes on their practice. I have not been yet, so I don't know how diverse those are. I, I, I'm planning and you know find, finding a weekend. They meet during the weekends, finding a weekend where I can actually uh, stop by and, and see uh, what's going on there. Um. That's that's really interesting. I I and I, I know that you you sent me a list of links, uh, Stoic links, uh, and uh, the blogging heads people will will will, will put them on uh, with our dialogue so people can check this stuff out. Um, I guess the last thing I wanted to say, um, and may, maybe sort of talk a little bit about about the choices I've made. Um, when we talk about, you know, we're talking about developing a sense of meaningfulness in one's life and also finding a source of what's broadly uh, called consolation. Yes. And um, um, to me, meaningfulness ultimately uh, derives obviously between my relationship between me and what I'm doing uh, uh, and also between me and uh, the other people with whom I'm connected. And That's right. on that side of it, 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 it stems from both the um, the sort of the, the depth of that connection uh, and, and as well as it's, as well as its nature. And, you know, what I'm wondering about is the way that I typically think of being connected to others often has to do with often centers around major stage of life events. Um, yes. Ch children being born, um, coming, people coming of age, um, uh, marriages, um, and these sorts of uh, life cycle events, deaths, obviously, right. um, and these um, in traditional religions are highly organized. Um, and so, so the example that I, I, I gave you when we got cut off was uh, I just recently attended a bat mitzvah. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're a Jewish family involved with our, our local synagogue. It's a reform synagogue, which means it's very modern, very liberal. I would say if the people, the, the, the congregants have hold any supernatural commitments, they're minimal to none um, simply because of the demographics, the sorts of people that belong. They're all highly educated. They're doctors and lawyers and professors and things like this. Right. Um, and, um, it's a very tight knit community because we live in the buckle of the Bible belt. There's only one synagogue and basically every Jew in the city belongs to it. Yes. I've had um, that similar experience when I was in Knoxville, Tennessee, where, you know, after a little bit, I found, I, I, I knew every liberal and every, every non-religious person in the, in town because, you know, yeah. Right. And there is, by the way, interestingly enough, a Unitarian church here mm -hmm. too, that sort of takes all the liberal refugees from evangelical churches right. and collects them into one place. And we often do things in town with them. But what I was getting at was that um, one of the things that this bot missile was there were a, a number of rituals which really sort of articulated our connectedness to one another. One of them being this, this practice of uh, passing the Torah from one person to another until you hand it to the, the, the person who's currently uh, coming up for a bat mitzvah. In this case, they select, they elected, a family elected to have all of this young girl's teachers mm -hmm. who had taught her in Sunday school, which included me, be amongst the people that pass the Torah to her. But sometimes it's done from families. When my daughter is bat mitzvah next year, her grandfather is going to hand the Torah to me and I'm going to hand the Torah to her. Right. And I find these sorts of rituals very emotionally uh, uh, moving. Uh, they, 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 in a sense, remind me of the depth of my investment with these other people. And um, in my case, it also has to do with the fact that I was raised in this tradition from, from my childhood. And I guess what I'm asking is, can something like neo-Stoicism, which one adopts as an adult, um, which one adopts at least initially on largely intellectual grounds, uh, maybe out of a desire for meaningfulness and consolation. Um, can it provide this sense of connectedness or do you really still have to also have alongside it either a deep investment in your family or in your, 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 your people's history or in your nationality or right. something else that really gets deep at the relationship between you and those who you feel connected with. No, I, I think you're right. Uh, I think you need both. Uh, I, don't, I don't. I don't think that a practice like stoicism, at least not in the way it is practiced today, can offer you that. Precisely because uh, it, you know it doesn't. First of all, people do arrive at it late in, in uh, later in life. Not, not they're not brought into it from from the, when they're very young or, or, or when they're kids, and that makes a huge difference. I sus I suspect that's also one of the reasons why. 
uh, things like ethical culture don't do very well because typically people join late in life. It's bad, it's right. often very late in life. Um, you know that the average age of age of, age of people uh, go to ethical culture or unitarian uh, um, events are it is fairly high. So you don't do that now. Of course, these groups are are aware of it and they are trying to do you know children uh, programs and all that. But so far, at least, it hasn't happened in the same way in which a, a regular church or a synagogue uh, would do. Uh, so Stoicism has nothing like that. It's not an organized religion to begin with. Um, it, it's just a philosophy of life. It's a way of looking at things philosophically. So, so it, it cannot provide that sort of thing. Um, that, that sort of connection, deep connection with, with your family, friends, and sort of your immediate community has to come from somewhere else. Now, that somewhere else can be going to a reform, you know, synagogue, or it can be in a sort of a Unitarian uh, or ethical culture, or even a church. So I think that those are actually complementary. In my case, it comes from a uh, uh, network of family and, and uh, friends rela relations that has always been the way I've got that sort of uh, need that you're talking about taken care of or, or yeah. you know, addressed. That is, I never went to church, even when I was a kid. So I don't have that sort of thing. But I do, but of course, as a family, and then later on with my own friends, now that I live in a completely different place in the country from where I was raised, uh, you know, uh, as, as a kid, um, you know, we have this kind of connection. And we do, in fact, you're right, pay a lot of attention to rites of passage. And, you know, we get together and we have uh, gatherings and, you know, parties and all that sort of stuff about to mark that kind of event. So absolutely, that, that sort of thing. But what the Stoicism does, it, it can in Enhance those kind of um, uh, relations because it makes you more mindful of yeah. their meaning. It makes you practice also uh, the kind of behavior that actually increases the quality of those relationships. I mean, I was uh, it was kind of amusing to to see uh, one of the posts recently on the uh, on the Facebook page of the Stoicism Today uh, project about this guy who said, you know, I'm having a problem with my girlfriend because uh, since I've been practicing Stoicism, I actually, I don't get angry anymore. And <laughs> and she's she's complaining about the fact that, you know, now she's the one that gets upset and, and then she feels guilty about <laughs> being angry, which is, you know, it's an interesting problem to have, but I actually have noticed that sort of thing uh, in myself, even over the last you know, a few weeks that I actually started practicing that, uh, you know, it's not like all of a sudden you become a saint, you know, mind you, this is not a miracle uh, cure for, for human behavior. Um, but it does, but again, the fact that you, the more you practice and the more you, you become mindful of what you do and how you react to things, the, the better you are able to, to do it. Um, it actually does, I think it, it makes you a, a better person. I mean, that's the whole point. And therefore it makes you also a, be a better social actor. Uh, it, it makes you a, a interact with other people, especially the people you care for, uh, directly in, in a more positive and more meaningful way. I really, I really like that. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll close on this. I just want to sort of reiterate it because now that I'm thinking about my own case, I think it's probably true in my case as well. This idea that the, the the stoicism uh the philosophy in a sense enhances these more um i don't want to call them primitive but more sort of instinctual right. uh, more basic uh, yeah yeah um, um i'm wondering if i wasn't a trained philosopher mm -hmm. if and and wasn't prone to sort of very deep reflection if i would find these events as moving as as i do i mean right. it's actually it's sort of become a joke that i cry at every bat mitzvah <laughs> and i'm one of the only ones because i sort of sitting there thinking about oh what is this this means this what this is so meaningful right. and i've known this girl since she was two years old and uh, and it's sort of um yes it you does, reflect it provide a frame with exactly. it exactly <laughs> exactly you reflect on it and reflecting on it doesn't you know this this is a this is really a preconceived Perception that in modern society we need to get away from the, the idea that if you reflect on something, if you think about something, somehow that detracts from the emotional enjoyment of that something. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, it depends on how it's done. Uh, yes, sometimes reflecting and thinking uh, on, on things can, in fact, lead to emotional detachment. But if it is well done, uh, and if, if done philosophically in the broad sense of you know loving wisdom uh, uh, kind of philosophy, now I, I think it becomes an, an enhancement. Not uh, and so you may be a case uh, in, in point. Yeah, yeah, that's that is so true. I really really appreciate that. Well, Massimo, we managed to do it. We managed to uh, re refilm our last third. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. We stuck pretty. We stuck pretty close to what I think we did last time. It might even be a little better. And. Uh, as always, I really appreciate your time and your wisdom, and I really enjoy uh, speaking with you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Stopping now.